at the end of that, um, I joined some friends of mine in a, a market making firm in Chicago. We were bond options traders at the Board of Trade. And uh, was one of those people that wears a really bad tie and a funny jacket and waves your hands around and screams all day long. It's a very similar job to being a conductor. Um, <laughs> and uh, oh, uh, it was a great gig. It was really fun. Uh, and it was working with some friends, and it was basically self employment, and it was something that I really enjoyed. However, all the time during school, as well as my time uh, at the, the bond trading firm, I missed music. I missed. But what I missed about it wasn't playing the tuba. What I missed about it wasn't making music or being an artist like so many people talk about. What I missed about it was the responsibility and the opportunity to entertain people, to stand in front of people and either talk or play, or hopefully both, um, and uh, take them on some sort of journey to have that responsibility. There was no responsibility for that uh, in the other scenarios that I had worked in in business school. I did a consulting project for Ford. I worked for 3M uh, Healthcare for a summer, um, working on a centrifugal pump for open heart surgery, blah, blah, blah. Um, there were never those types of performance opportunities um, inside of the company, uh, except when there was time to do a presentation. And then I was always the one that wanted to do the presentation because I liked so much that, uh, that responsibility and that opportunity to uh, engage people. Um, uh, so I decided before the end of the first year at the bond firm that uh, I was going to quit and just become a soloist. Declare myself a soloist and see. The re main reason being as I was 26 at the time, I thought if I give myself five years when I'm 31, which was a few years ago, um, I'll be the average age of the person that I was graduating with from my MBA school. Most of the people were a lot older than I was. I thought, so I'll be 31 with an MBA from Michigan and have failed uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial venture, perfectly normal, perfectly mm -hmm. normal. So I thought it's the perfect, perfect scenario for me. So I quit um, business, became a soloist. Um, I made a whopping, I don't know, there's not much money my first year as a soloist. I didn't work much. I taught mostly out of the house and then did a few solos here and there. But it's it's snowballed um, into uh, I don't know what do you call it, Charlie? Something strange. Something strange. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. That's what my wife called it anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, it's, I mean, I get to, I'm very fortunate. I get to make my living doing what I always wanted to do, what I love to do. And I don't, I don't, I report to nobody. I mean, I, this is my own thing. And it's busy. And it's a good living. Um, and it's, it's doing what I, what I dreamed about. So you have to be careful in a lot of situations in the course of your life because sometimes what you wish for, you actually get. Um, and you have to be ready to get it if it comes. So, um, uh, that's what I do now. I work. This year is uh, sort of the end of uh, the massive amount of traveling. Um, it's 150 dates, and I'm out well over half the year. Next year, it's it's going down to 30 dates, um, mostly with orchestra and a couple with piano and a few residencies here and there. Um, and uh, because I have a family now, a daughter at home and a son coming in August and uh, or July, depending. And um, so that my focus has changed again. But I'm fortunate enough to have sort of uh, broken through, I don't know if that's the right word, but um, I'm finally getting the opportunity as a, as a brass soloist to work in front of an orchestra as the soloist with an orchestra. And uh, it's 20 times next year, which is pretty unusual. So I'm very fortunate, I'm very lucky to be able to do that. So that's what I do. In the course of that process of doing what I do, and I'll play for you in a second, um, comes my approach to how I play the instrument, or how I, how I, you know, make this plumbing of pistons uh, do what it does. And uh, the bulk of that comes from the time that I spent studying with Mr. Jacobs. Um, what, what I'll talk about tonight in terms of that and my approach to playing is not my own. It's his entirely sifted through my experience with him. And, uh, but it's such a nice, easy, simplistic, Approach to problem solving when you play that I want to make sure I talk about it uh, so that you can take that with you and, and apply it in your own time in your, with your own playing. Um, so let's, let's do that and I'll, I'll demonstrate as we go. So there's basically two things about playing the brass instrument and this applies for all brass instruments. There's the easy part of playing a brass instrument and there's the difficult part about playing a brass instrument. 
If you learn to execute the easy part of playing a brass instrument perfectly every time you pick up the instrument, there's nothing that you need to know about the difficult part about playing a brass instrument. Because that difficult part about playing a brass instrument has nothing to do with skill acquisition. It has to do with what you can't do when you play. So the best thing is to be able to learn to do the easy part, which I'm going to teach you in less than half an hour, so that you don't have to worry about the difficult parts, since you can't do the difficult part. So let me ask you a few rhetorical questions, which means you don't have to answer. <laughs> you pick up your instrument. You put the mouthpiece in. What's the goal? The goal is to make sound. So that would be the result, the end of our equation. How do we make sound on the brass instrument? There has to be some sort of vibration or buzz, my favorite word, buzz. Um, thank you. <laughs> some sort of buzz. How do we make buzz happen on a Friday evening, for example? Everybody should know the answer. <laughs> Don't answer that. The police are in the door. Um, we make vibration on a brass instrument by moving air. So the basic directly relational equation for playing a brass instrument is that air makes buzz make sound. That's how it works. It's quantitative and because it's directly relational, any kind of descriptor you use for the first part has to be used for all three parts. So good air, good buzz, good sound, bad air, bad buzz, bad sound. You're all brass players and we know about a bad buzz. We don't want that to happen, right? Because we were all in college once, remember? And it's also quantitative in nature. More air, more buzz, more sound, less air, less buzz, less sound. You know that's true because you know that it's easier to play in one breath longer when you're playing softer than when you're playing louder. Yes? This is empirical information. So that part's simple. You understand that. So if air makes buzz, makes sound, Direct relational, it always works in this direction, air, buzz, sound, every single time it happens. What's the most important part about playing a brass instrument? Air. Yeah. Air, yes. How you breathe. How you breathe. So other than certs and tic-tacs and <coughs> smints, <laughs> give me some attributes that you would describe for taking a good breath on playing a brass instrument. How would you describe a good breath? Anything. Just shout them out. Breathing from the diaphragm. Breathing from the diaphragm. Okay, we'll talk about that. Anything else? Open. Mm -hmm. Capacity. Open. Open. Relaxed. Easy. Capacity. Relaxed. Yep. Make it easy. Like you normally breathe. Like you normally breathe. Okay. Yeah. I've laughed around the gym to get the idea. <laughs> For heavy breathing. <laughs> That's another topic. <laughs> There's a phone number for that, and it always starts with a nine. 